If you're barely joining us, you haven't been here or you weren't here last week, let me give you a recap. We started uh, John chapter 13. The message was titled, At the Upper Room Cafe, because they were beginning with the uh, Passover feast there. And they're in the upper room. You can imagine you got Jesus and, and the 12 disciples there all sitting in, in this uh, coffee table, uh, U-shaped table, maybe oval. It was low to the ground. That's what we know. They were resting on their left hand or, or left elbow. They had their right hand free to eat. We know that Judas was to the left of Jesus. We know that John the Apostle was to the right of Jesus. And Peter was somewhere maybe directly in front of the table. Though that, that's their positions. And you'll see why they matter as we read the text today. What I want us to do, though, is uh, reread John 13, 1 to 17 to get the background and remember where we're at so we can pick up in verse 18. So if you can open your Bibles up, John 13, verse 1. It says, Now before the feast of a Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own, who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Verse 2, And supper being ended, the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Verse 8, Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, You are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you, sell, you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Verse 16, Most assuredly I say to you, A servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. And that's where we left off last week. We saw this amazing example of humility because the Lord of Lords chose to become the least of the least of the servants. The servants um, would do uh, really, you know, they did the work of a servant, right? But the lowest of the servant was the guy that washed the, uh, the guest's feet, right? And remember, it was a sandal community. There was no paved roads. They would pick up all kinds of stuff between their toes, crud, and all this and that. So the lowest of the servant were bring a basin, start washing the feet of the guests. Jesus did this, and I believe it was while they were having the conversation about who would be the greatest, right? And Jesus does this right at the right time, in my opinion. He starts washing their feet, and he shows them, look, to be the greatest, you've got to be the lowest. It's not about pride. It's about lowering yourself. It's about humility. And he showed them that great example in the earlier chapter, and he does point to the fact that Judas is not saved when he said, not all of, uh, there is one that is not washed, referring to Judas Iscariot. He was going to betray him. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Today's message is titled, uh, Soup Betrayal, Betrayal to Go. Right? I made that word up, betrayal. It's supposed to be French. Um, <laughs> but the point is, they're eating right. Um, Judas is going to take off as soon as he, he sort of uh, takes the bread here and, and be, take off to betray Jesus. So we're going to focus on betrayal. We're going to focus on the three predictions that Jesus does. That's one of them. Judas' betrayal. Jesus predicts his soon death. And he predicts... Peter's denial. Remember I told you about the 3D pain? Jesus was double-crossed, denied by Peter, and deserted by the rest of the, of the disciples there. Let me start off with a, with a, in a, a story I, I read the other day. A Charlotte, North Carolina man, having purchased a box of very rare, very expensive cigars, insured them against fire, among other things. Within a month, having smoked his entire stockpile of cigars, and without having made even his first premium payment on the policy, the man filed a claim against the insurance company. In his claim, the man stated, the cigars were lost in a series of small fires. The insurance company refused to pay. 
citing the obvious reason that the man had consumed the cigars in a normal fashion. The man sued and won. In delivering the ruling, the judge agreed that the claim was frivolous. He stated, nevertheless, that the man held a policy from the company in which it had warranted that the cigars were insurable and also guaranteed that it would insure against fire without defining what is considered to be uh, unacceptable fire and was obligated to pay the claim. Rather than, than endure a lengthy, costly appeal process, the insurance company accepted the ruling and paid the man 15 grand for the rare cigars he had lost in the fires. So here comes the best part. After the man cashed the check, the insurance company had him arrested on 24 counts of arson with his own insurance claim <laughs> and testimony from the previous case being used against him. The man was convicted of intentionally burning his insured property and sentenced 24 months in jail with a $24,000 fine, right? And that's sweet, right? When you, when, you know, people pay for what they do, right? And here Satan thought he was winning by, by sort of entering into Judas and he thought he was going to silence Jesus. But he didn't know that the Lord also had that in his plan to put Jesus on a cross but to die for the sins of the world. Yeah. At the same time, you know, God, the Lord uses the things that are meant for evil for good for us. This man we're going to talk about today, um, really, his name is not even popular. A lot of baby names books don't even want to include him. It's not on the top list of baby name books. His name is Judas. And though his name does necessarily uh, mean, it's not a bad meaning, his name. It means praise. It comes from the word Judah. His name has had a bad reputation because of what he did, right? And we all know that. Synonyms for his name have been used uh, as a apostate, backstabber, betrayer, double-crosser, double-dealer, narc, serpent, snake, turncoat, all these synonyms, right? His name is, is, is just used to, to refer to somebody that has betrayed somebody, right? A friend that has betrayed another. And I would add to that, uh, a Judas would be the guy that calls you in the car as soon as you, and then as soon as you reach the door handle, he takes off. A Judas is the guy that took your girl in high school, or vice versa, right? A Judas is a person who's nice to you when you're around, but as soon as you walk away, he starts talking bad about you. Uh, Judas is the friend you keep asking for those pair of jeans that you let him borrow three months ago, and, but you know in the back of your mind he's not going to give them back to you. A Judas is a person that keeps saying, spot me, I'll get you back, but never repays you. A Judas is a man that put a price on a friend who was willing to die for him. And that's the Judas we're talking about today. Judas. He betrayed Jesus Christ, the Lord of Lords. And you, I want you guys to really notice this because this is very important. We see that Judas was also one of the guys that got his feet washed, okay? The Lord had Judas in his place of, of honor. It was his special guest because he was right next to Jesus as well. He was loving on Judas all the time. Je Jesus never really rebuked Judas. Look at verse 18. I titled uh, this section, verse 18 and 30, Biting the hand that feeds you. Verse 18, chapter 13 says, I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. He who eats bread with me. Remember, they're at the table now, and he's not specifying who it is. Because everybody, everybody's eating bread with him. But he's pointing out that it is one of the twelve that was going to betray Jesus. He says it in this form. He says, has lifted up his heel against me. And you sort of see this word picture of, an, of a horse or a donkey with his uh, leg lifted, about to strike. That's what he's trying to portray here, right? He was about to betray Jesus Christ. He's also uh, referencing Psalm uh, 41, 9, where, where David talks about how he was betrayed by one of his friends. His name was uh, Ahithophel, Ahithophel. During uh, David's uh, run from Absalom, while Absalom was chasing David, Ahithophel, one of his friends, betrayed him. He took on, he went to the other side and betrayed uh, David. And all this Psalm 41 was about that. He says um, in the New Living Translation, Psalm 41, 9, David says, Even my best friend, the one I trusted completely, the one who shared my food, has turned against me. And that's the same thing we see with Judas here. Another interesting thing I want to point out is that this guy Ahithophel, he hung himself as well. He did the same thing Judas uh, did. So the question is, so why did Ju Jesus choose Judas if he knew he was going to betray him? For one, one obvious reason we see here is that the scriptures might be fulfilled, as it says in verse 18, right? 
So Jesus was sort of laying it out for the disciples here. It was all prophesied. You got to go back to the scriptures and see what they, we got to be like the Bereans, you know, test to see whether these things are so. He was trying to comfort them. He was trying to tell them, this is not catching me by surprise. There, is no, there hasn't been uh, anything that has happened that's going to get in the way of the purpose that the Lord has given me. Right? Verse 19 says, Now I tell you before it comes, that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am He. Right? Did they not believe that Jesus was the I am there? Did they not believe that Jesus was, was uh, the Messiah? They did. But here the word believe in the... In the the form in the Greek, how it is, it's, it's sort of active. There's an active tense there. And it's sort, of, it's sort of saying that you might continue to believe. That's actually why the whole Gospel of John was written, that you might continue to believe. So it's not for new believers, not just for new believers, but also for mature believers, that they might continue to grow in the faith. And this strengthens us, you know, prophecy. He's sort of revealing what's to come. And, that, and that's what the Bible does. It's prophecy. Things that it has, it has foretold, they, they, they tend to happen. Right? And there are happening. Jesus fulfilled about 300 and some of them. Let's continue here. Another point I like to make is right here in verse 19 where it says that I am he. The he is not there in the original. It literally says that I am. So the same Jesus, of the, the same God of the New Testament is the same God of the Old Testament. Jesus is God, Jehovah. Abraham Lincoln said, you can fool some of the people all of the time. And all of the people some of the time. But you cannot fool all of the people all of the time. Judas thought he was betraying Jesus as well. He might have had the rest of the guys fooled, but not Jesus. Not the person he wanted to. Verse 20 says, Most assuredly, or verily, verily, if you got a King James, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. I think he's basically telling him, look, nothing's been thwarted. You guys are still on the mission, you know. The Father sent me, I sent you. You guys are still on the mission. I'm going to take off, but you guys are still on the plan. Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. And it's always been the gospel that saves people. It's never been a single, not one single person has saved another. Right? Greg Laurie hasn't saved a single person. Billy Graham hasn't either. Or Charles Templeton, which was a contemporary of Billy Graham back in the days, which he actually apostatized from the faith eventually, you know, they reached people for the Lord, but it was the gospel that has the power to save people. Verse 21 says, when Jesus had said these things, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, most assuredly I say to you, one of you will betray me. Jesus is still on the point and he's sort of getting closer, he's giving clues. First he said, it's one of you guys that are eating with me, now he gets more specific, it's one of you guys. And you can imagine these guys just looking at each other, you know. Sort of like the game of Clue there. So we see uh, in the earlier verse it says that, you know, that you might believe that I am. We see Jesus' deity there. But here in verse 21 it says that he was troubled in spirit, right? Jesus is also human, right? And he felt things we feel. He was hurt because Judas was a friend. He, knew, he loved Judas. He was going to die for Judas as well. Look at what Luke twenty two twenty one 21 tells us. But behold the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table. Verse 22 in chapter 13 again, Then the disciples looked at one another, perplexed about whom he spoke. And Luke uh, tells us, They began to question among themselves which of them it was would do this thing. In Mark 14.21 it says, The Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had never been born. So Mark tells us what John, Luke, and Matthew did not, right? It, was, it would have been better for Judas not to have even been born, right? Was God forcing Judas to, you know, had God made Judas betray Jesus? No. But God did know by his foreknowledge that Judas would have betrayed him, okay? There is no forcing here. Judas has, you know, been moved by his own will. Now, verse 23, now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Now it's believed that it was John the Apostle here. Okay? John the Apostle is being humble. He's referring to himself as the one that Jesus loved. Okay? He, wasn't say, he wasn't boasting about how much he loves Jesus. Okay? He was boasting about how much Jesus loved him. He acknowledged that. The question I have for you guys and for me as well, you know, do I acknowledge that Jesus loves me? Do I believe it? Right? Do I live like I believe it? 
And, and we see that John, John believed it. Another key point is that he was leaning on Jesus' bosom, so that's why we say he was to the right of Jesus. Because, okay, if you're, if you're resting on your left hand, and if Jesus is here, and if your head is next to Jesus' bosom, you can assume, okay, I'm to the right of Jesus. Also in a privileged position there. Look at verse 24. Simon Peter therefore motioned to him to ask who it was of whom he spoke. See, they didn't know yet, right? But Simon knew that John was next to Jesus, so he's like, hey, you know, he's probably texting him under the table. Tell him to tell you who it is, right? He's probably got his sword next to him, you know, so I can cut his ear off, right? That's how, that's how Peter was, right? He wanted to put a stop to, uh, to what was going on. He always went to the extremes. And he probably would have if we would have found out. Judas would have left there missing an ear. Let's continue here. Uh, verse 25. Then leaning back on Jesus' breast, he said to him, Lord, who is it? Verse 26. Jesus answers him, It is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now this bread thing, this giving of the bread, was an eastern way of... of doing a toast, okay? The guest of honor would get this, this piece of flat bread and it was given to him by, by the host. That was a customary thing to do for the guest of honor that would come. Jesus was still loving on Judas. He loved him. We should love our enemies as well. And though we know we can't do that, do, do that by our own strength, we do it by the Holy Spirit. So basically, he's giving Judas a toast here, right? Interesting thing I, 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 I sort of saw was when Judas betrays Jesus, he also does sort of a, an act of friendship, but we know it's hypocritical. He sort of, Jesus points out Judas by a, a toast, but Judas points out Jesus by a kiss to, his, uh, to the authorities. Look at Matt, what Matthew 26, 25 says. Then Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? He said to him, you have said it. Verse 27 of John says, now after the piece of bread, Satan entered him. Then Jesus said to him, What you do, do quickly. If you go back to John 13, 2, it says that Satan has sort of a implanted a thought, right? To betray Jesus Christ, right? And now we see here in this verse, 27, that Satan entered him, right? You know, when people become possessed, non-Christians non for that matter, is it, it's a gradual thing, okay? For, for people that are... Uh, uh, that are not saved, they have to be dabbling, you know, in occult stuff, uh, paganistic stuff, Ouija board, you know, all this stuff, you know, even drugs, pharmacia, all that stuff before the enemy even does anything. They have to give in, right? They got to give him a foothold before he goes in. And that's what we see here. It was a gradual process with Judas. His greed, right? He already had that sin in him. All the devil had to do was throw little thoughts in his head, right? And he ran with them. Eventually, we see here now that Satan entered him. The commentator Gabellian says, Once Judas left the room to seal his bargain with the priest, he would pass the point of no return. His yielding to, the, to selfish impulse opened the way to satanic control. And we know Judas was not a true believer, right? John 6.70 says, I chose the twelve of you, but one is a devil. Jesus had already mentioned it beforehand. You know, and and I, I stand with my, my belief that a, a born-again Christian cannot be possessed by a demon or the enemy for that matter. J. Bernard McGee says, a Christian cannot be possessed, but there's no guarantee that a church member can't. And there is a difference. Church membership does not make you a born-again Christian, right? That is a difference. Sometimes we say, well, I know that guy, he goes to church, and then and he's possessed now. What's going on? Right? Well, again, it's being born again. The Bible does call us to resist the devil. So we are to we can be oppressed, but not possessed. That's what the Lord calls us to. James 4, 7 says, Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And God doesn't share his temple. If you're, if you're a believer here now, you are the temple of the Lord. You cannot be inhabited by another. 1 John 4, 4 says, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? God does not share his home with the enemy, right? 
A lot of times, though, we as Christians, we tem tend to blame the, the enemy for what happens in our lives, right? We say, the enemy made me do it. Right? Babe, I'm sorry. I did this and that. The enemy made me do it. <laughs> James 1.14 says, But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, he gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Right? We have, we're accountable too. Greg Laurie says, it's not the bait that constitutes temptation, it's the bite. Like the rest of us, Judas had opportunity to resist temptation, but instead he took the bait and ran with it, betraying Jesus out of greed. Let's continue back in verse 28 here of John. But no one at the table knew for what reason he said this to him. For some thought, because Judas had the money box, right, he was in charge of the finances, that Jesus had said to him, Buy those things we need for the feast. Remember, the feast was a seven-day thing. There was going to be more eating and uh, dining. Or that he should give something to the poor. Verse 30, having received the piece of bread, he then went out immediately, and it was night. And I started pondering on this. Okay, why would John mention what, how it looked outside? What's the purpose of that, right? And it was night. There's some symbolism here, right? When we walk away from the light, we are we go into darkness. Judas was now surrounded by physical and spiritual uh, darkness. Right? He went out into the night, sort of saying he's left the light. He's walked away from his chance of, of being saved, of repenting and turning to Christ. But we know in the garden, Jesus says, Jesus calls him friend again. I think Jesus is still opening up, given the opportunity. Let's go on to the next uh, prediction here or the next command, the fresh commandment is what I called it, verse 31 to 35. So when he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and glorify him immediately. There's five glorifies right there. What do I get from it? Jesus is about glorifying God. What should we get from it? We should be about glorifying God as well. But notice... In verse 33, it says, Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me, as I said to the Jews. Where I am going, you cannot come. So now I say to you. So let's stop, let's stop there for a minute. He calls them little children. He's never called them that before, according to the Gospel of John. Um, but notice that he didn't call them that till after Judas left the scene. He's out of the upper room now. Now he's going to focus, again, on pouring his true, his true disciples. And this is a, a thing, a word that John the, John the Apostle uses a lot in his epistles. Calls him little children, beloved, and all this. Another proof that, that John is the writer of John, the Gospel of John. Notice what he tells them in verse 34. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now we're going to go back to this verse and I'm going to sort of exposit on it uh, in one of my points but something that we need to take note of is that before they couldn't fulfill this command and it, it can also be rendered the word new it can also be rendered fresh okay so it's a fresh view of a commandment but notice it's different than the old commandment the previous commandment that said love your neighbor as yourself now he's telling them not to love people as yourself but to love each other as I have loved you. And didn't he just portray that in the earlier verses as he became a servant? Let's go to the third part of this message, his third prediction, how Peter sells out. Verse 36, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, Where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you shall follow me afterward. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? So we see here Jesus predicting his, predicting his death, but also he's also alluding to the death of, of, of Peter in the future. After Jesus leaves, when the Holy Spirit comes, he does his ministry, he writes the epistles. So we see here that Jesus is going to heaven, right? He's going to die, but Peter is not going to die just yet. He, he says, you shall follow me afterward. And we know through church tradition, history and all that, that Peter did die on the cross as well. But he felt unworthy to die like Jesus, so he wanted to be crucified upside down, according to some church tradition. So we see here that he eventually did die for Jesus. But in the meantime, he, he wasn't going to do that. Look at Matthew 26, 31. 
Then Jesus said to them, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. So Matthew tells us this, this was also a prophecy that was to happen. And we see the, the fourth prediction here. Look at what Luke tells us now in Luke twenty two thirty one, 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you. And that's plural right there, okay? So he's not just referring to Peter there. That he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you. And the singular is found there in the you there. That your faith should not fail, and when you have returned to me, now he's prophesying that Peter would come back to him. But he's implying that Peter was going to deny him by, by saying, when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. And didn't Peter strengthen his brethren? All the epistles he wrote was about encouraging the persecuted church. Again, another fulfillment there. Verse 33, but he said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you, both to prison and to death. Let's skip back a little bit here. At first he says, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you, that he may sift you as wheat. In other words, he's telling him, uh, the devil wants to punch your face in, but don't worry, I'm going to pray for you, right? That, that's that's uh, scary, right? But notice that the devil had to ask, you know, the, the enemy can't do anything unless it's by permission. And we see that in Job, and we see that here, alluded to in Luke 22. God is still in control. But see, the enemy had to do with Jesus' betrayal by Judas, and he also wanted something to do with the desertion and denial of Jesus as well. Verse 37b says, I will lay down my life for your sake. Jesus answered him, Will you lay down your life for my sake? Most assuredly I say to you, the rooster shall not crow till you have denied me three times. Now Matthew's account in the New Living says, Peter, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me deny it three times that you even know me. Right? And we know that. Well, I think all of us already know that what Peter did. And we try, we sort of, you know, we sometimes bash on Peter. In heaven, he's, we think, oh, well, he's Peter, the denier of Jesus, right? But he's more than that. I think all of us would have, you know, they all, in a sense, they all denied him. They all deserted him. Yeah, we do see John there later with, his, with, his, with Mary. He's taking care of her, right? Mark uh, 14, 29 says, Peter said to him, Even if all are made to stumble, yet I will not be. But he spoke more vehemently. If I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they all, see, they all said, Likewise, they all, we can't just blame Peter for speaking out of, of you know, saying things that he wasn't going to do. I like what Chuck Smith says. He says, Peter wanted to die for the Lord, but had trouble, trouble living for the Lord. And that brings us to our first point. Don't sell out, but be sold out for Jesus Christ. Right? We cannot sell out. And though sometimes we might deny Jesus, sometimes we might, um, you know, deny him in front of others by refusing to pray during our work lunches or refusing to witness to somebody, we must remember that there's always another opportunity to come back to the Lord and say, Lord, forgive me. Let me try again. Let me do this by your power. Something to notice here is that Peter was relying on his own self-will. He says, I will not deny you. I will go to jail with you and die for you, right? But he couldn't even live for Jesus. How was he going to die for him? A lot of... Uh, Self-professed Christians say, you know, I'm not following Jesus now. I'm doing this stuff in the world. I want to get my fill in the world first, and then I'm going to come back and start following the Lord when I get older, right? Or if the rapture happens, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to take the mark, and that'll be my second chance. But really, my question to people like that is, if you're not, dying, if you're not uh, following the Lord now, if you're not standing up for Jesus now, how are you going to do it when there is oppression, right? There is no, no real oppression now, not in the U.S. anyway. David Gusick says, To him, a servant girl's tongue was sharper than an executioner's sword. You know, he was worried about a little, girl's, a little girl saying out loud that he was a follower of Jesus Christ. We can be like Peter too in the sense that we say we're going to do something, but we never do it. Right? Um, sometimes I get these memes. If you, do you know what a meme is? Can you raise your hand if you do? Okay, a little bit. Okay, a meme is like a, a picture, right? And it can be a picture of anything, and you sort of add words to it to make it funny. So there's this meme about this guy. He's taking, he's asleep, right? So on the top part of the picture, it says, uh, um, "You convince yourself when you convince yourself to do something in the morning, 
when you tell yourself you, at night you're going to do something in the morning, but then in the morning, when the morning comes and the alarm clock rings, right, you, you convince yourself it's not really that important. And we're really like that. I'm like that too. I put snooze on my alarm about three, four times before I really get up. And, uh, you know, the clock crows and we don't do what, what the Lord, what we told the Lord we were going to do. We need to let our yes be yes and our no be no. But how do we, how are we supposed to be sold out for Jesus? I think Matthew tells us in six, chapter 16. He says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Okay, there's, there's one thing. Take up his cross, two things, and follow me, three things. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world, or 30 pieces of silver for Judas, and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? So the real question is, to finish up this one point, is what's stopping you from being sold out for Christ? And it's a, it's a different story with every person here. It's a different uh, story with me as well. You know, I haven't reached that point. But continually, we need to just allow, give, th hand things over to the Lord. Make Him the Lord of every part of our lives. My second point is, Submit and resist. We saw the enemy had influence on people here. So we need to submit and resist. James 4, 7 again. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil. There's a prescribed uh, prescription there. Submit and resist, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. So it's not just about, okay, I'm going to resist the devil, right? It's about getting the God of the word by the word of God in us. You get that? Okay, we need to get the God of the Word into us by the Word of God. And we do that through Bible studies, through prayer, right? Peter here, we saw that he thought he could stand. He thought he wasn't going to fail. And 1 Corinthians 10, 12 tells us, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Right? Peter was trusting in himself to be sold out for Jesus. And really, we need to let go of ourselves and submit to him. Right? As it says here, submit and resist. But again, how do we resist the devil now? And I sort of came up with four ways, right? And they're biblical ways. Number one, be on your guard. Be on your guard. How do we do that? New Living Translation, 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Stay alert. Watch out for your enemy, for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a rolling lion looking for someone to devour. Don't give the enemy your back. He's on a constant lookout, right? I'm not saying to make a big deal about devil, angelology, demonology, and all that. Don't get into that. That's not what I'm telling you to do. But what I'm telling you to do is be aware that it is a spiritual battle, and he does throw things in your mind. He does want to tempt you. How did, the, how did, Jesus, how did Jesus fight the enemy? Or how, how did, when he was tempted in, in, in the wilderness? With the word of God, right? That brings us our second rule of resisting the devil. Be ruled by the word. Take advantage of the Bible studies that we have, you know? If you think you're equipped to do, teach a Bible study, well, start your own Bible study. When I started my first Bible study, I didn't, I didn't do it through Calvary Chapel. I just did it in my house. You know, I had a, several people come, and that went on for a while, and then I, you know, did it with Calvary Chapel, you know, and the Lord blessed both of them. But it's through the Word of God. We need to get to, we need to know it in order to, to use it. Number three, how do we resist the devil? Move with faith. This is found in Ephesians 6.16. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And who is the wicked one? But the devil, right? The enemy. But it says above all. See, before this verse, it's talking about the, the armor of, of God, right? The, the, the feet shot with the gospel and all these things. But above all, that's why I included it here. The shield of faith. doesn't matter if you have all these things if you don't have faith. The just shall live by faith. And that is our shield. We've got to believe it or else how are we going to use it? And number four, don't let anger dwell, okay? That, that gives the enemy a foothold when we allow our hearts to get angry at others. Ephesians 4 tells us, don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you're ang still angry. For anger gives a foothold to the devil, right? Marriages, don't go to sleep before resolving your conflicts. Christians, if you have a problem with another brother in Christ, solve, go to each other and solve your problem before you even come to offer sacrifices of worship to the Lord, right? Fix your problem. The Lord wants the church to solve its own problems together, and he blesses them. Now, I have this book by Warren Worsby. It's titled The Strategy of Satan and How to Defeat Him, right? Um, 
I outlined it here, so this is all from Warren Worsby. So I'm just going to sort of review it for you guys, okay? He titles Satan as the deceiver. He targets your mind. His weapon is lies. Remember Jesus calls him the father of all lies. The purpose for him that he tries to do in your life is to make you ignorant of God's will for your life. And he did that with Eve, right? That was his first um, weapon he used there in the garden. He told Eve, did God really say that? He attacked God's word. And obviously Eve is not equipped to defend herself. He is the destroyer. He targets your body. His weapon is suffering. Purpose to make you impatient with God's will. And we see that with Job, right? He asked permission. He said, Lord, I bet you I can make him uh, deny you. Did he? No, he wasn't able to. But he attacked his body through suffering. Number three, he is the ruler. The Bible says he is the, the, the ruler of this world, the God of this age, little g there. He targets your will. His weapon is pride to make you independent of God's will. And I see that this a lot, you know. A lot of us, we think we're too good to serve the Lord. You know? I'm too good to do this job over here, but I'm ready to do this over here, right? God will bless, bless the, once you do the little things, God will bless those, right? He'll give you more things to do, right? He wants you to work your way up a lot of the times. But see, pride comes before the fall. And if the enemy can get you to be proud, he's going to make sure you fall like he did. The accuser now, his target is your heart and conscience. His weapon is accusation. His purpose is to bring an indictment by God's will. He wants you to feel guilty. He wants you down in the dumps in the gutter feeling guilty for yourself, discouraged. I said this last Wednesday, but in the book, uh, The Screwtape Letters by C.S. Lewis, he mentions a story about how the devil's having a yard sale and uh, the demons are all around trying to get tools to defeat man, right? So there's this one tool that one of these demon, demon picks up, and I'm paraphrasing here. But he brings it up to the devil. He's like, how much for this one? And the devil's like, oh, oh, this one's real expensive. And the demon's like, why? It's all rusty. It's old. And the devil says, that's why. Because it's been used the most. It's discouragement. And the enemy wants you to be discouraged. He wants you down in the dumps. You know why? Because you will be ineffective for the Lord. If he can't possess you, he's definitely going to make you, in, wants to make you ineffective. So we see here our two points. We need to... Don't sell out, but be sold out. Submit and resist. And my last point to finish up here, open and share a can of fresh love. So I want you guys to go back to verse 34 for a minute. Verse 34, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this I will know that you are my disciples, if you have loved for one another. Now I have four things for this here too, and they're pretty quick because I already mentioned two of them. Number one, it's not the same love as love your neighbor as yourself. It's different. Jesus has raised the bar. Jesus uh, says, you must love others as I have loved you. And he showed it by serving others. You want to know how to love somebody? Serve them. Number three, our love within the church will be a testimony. Back to 35, verse 35. By this, all will know that you are my disciples. If you want to be a, a light for Jesus, one of the things you can do is not necessarily go out and witness, approach strangers in the streets, okay? Or be a prayer warrior. It's by loving the people around you in church, okay? Churches get a bad rap. You know, one of the main things unbelievers say is, I'm not going to church because there's a bunch of hypocrites there, you know? And one of the things I usually say is, you know, there's going to be a bunch of hypocrites in hell too, so why do you want to go there? You know, just go to church. There's hypocrites everywhere, right? This is a hospital. We talk about sin, right? We talk about healing. It's a, it's a hospital for sinners. Again, right? To be a testimony, to be a light, we've got to love each other a different kind of love a fresh love number four jesus had demonstrated this is this in the full washing and treatment of his betrayer love your enemies too right love those who pursue curse you and, and persecute you and to finish up here my last two verses romans 12 12, 12 10 be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love in honor giving preference to one another doesn't that say to put other people before yourself right Put somebody before you. Number uh, Next reason here in Romans 13, 8. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. And you know, the, the Ten Commandments, that's basically what it is. You know, love God, uh, you know, love God and love people. Vertical, horizontal, right? It's split up into that. And Jesus said, you know, love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. The second one is similar to it. Love your neighbor as yourself. But now he tells him, he's talking to Christians here. Love each other as I have loved you, raising the bar, right? So that's my, uh, my reminder to us all because this is a, a, a statement for me too. We got to love each other. We got to pour out into each other. 
Pray for some. Call somebody. Call a Christian friend that you haven't called in a while. Give them a phone call. Ring them up. Tell them, hey, how are you doing? What can I pray for you about? That's a big thing sometimes because people think they don't care about them when, when people aren't calling them. You know? It's a big, little things are big things in Christian circles. You know? So let's do that today. You know? Find out what you can do for somebody else. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, <clears throat> I thank you, Lord, for this message. I thank you, Lord, for your word. As a lot of the times we've heard it before, but Lord, don't let that take pride in our hearts. Even though we heard it before, Lord, we know you like to remind us because we're like sheep. Or sometimes we're, we're, we're silly, Lord, and, and uh, we tend to, to forget things, Father God. We have a short attention span, and you need to remind us, Lord, by your word. So that's what we want to do, with Lord. We just want to take all, all you've given us here today, Father God. Lord, I want to pray too. There's somebody here today that doesn't know you, Father. Somebody here that would like to accept you today, Lord. I pray that they will raise their hand today. If there's anybody out there, if you don't know Jesus yet, and you want to accept him in your heart today by simply saying that you believe what he did for you on the cross, that you know you're a sinner and you can't get to heaven on your own, if you're here today, raise your hand and you want to accept Jesus. Is there anybody here today? Amen. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. I pray, Lord, for all of us that we might be sold out for you. Lord, uh, use us, Father God, because we know your coming is quick. Lord, so we pray, Father God, that we might be used greatly by you before you come so we, we may not be ashamed that you're coming, Lord. Help us to worship you now in spirit and truth, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand together.